Praise the Lord. Welcome to the Revivalist broadcast originating from River of Life Church in Pekin, Illinois of the United States of America. We come to you today with a vision burning within us to proclaim the whole counsel of God and the full power of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin, I wanted to share one thing with you, that if you have any prayer requests, any, any concerns that you'd like, we have intercessors here, we have intercessory prayer groups. And simply send your needs in to us. We'll be glad to pray over them. We'll believe God for a miracle in your life. Send them into our email address, which is the revivalist1234 at yahoo.com. Let me repeat that. It's the revivalist1234 at yahoo.com. Praise the Lord. We're back this week in John chapter 15. Um, we're going to begin this week at verse number 4. I've been going through John chapter 15. If you've caught any of the other broadcasts, as you understand, sharing with the, the kind of an outline that the Lord gave me out of that chapter of a revival church or a revivalist and how we can find many keys to revival in John chapter 15. Um, as we go to verse number 4 today, it says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. I want to focus this uh, on this broadcast in the first three words of that verse. Abide in me. Abide in me. We're going to find that that's very key, very instrumental in walking in revival. is an abiding relationship with Christ. I was watching uh, another broadcast the other day and a particular minister was ministering. And he was sharing about a, a testimony in his life, how the Lord really put an impact in him about abiding in Christ and that personal relationship with the Lord and how important that was, I guess you could say. But he was sharing that in the early days of his ministry, he was pastoring a church and it was kind of a smaller, struggling church in many people's eyes. And uh, he was invited to be on the board of a very large ministry. And he got there to board meeting. And he said he looked around at all the other pastors. They were all people who had pastored these great big huge churches and ministries and said you know he felt kind of small and in everybody else's eyes and here he was with this little tiny young struggling church and he was amongst all these pastors who were these pastors of these big huge ministries and he began to pray to the Lord about you know about feeling unworthy Lord I shouldn't be here I I don't know why I'm in this place why I'm in this position and, and I just don't feel qualified to be on this board and as he began to pray to the Lord like that, the Lord spoke to his heart and asked him very simply, he said, how many people would you need in your church then for you to feel qualified? How many people would you need in your church for you to feel happy? He says he just kind of went down the line and the Lord said, how about 500? How about 400? And, and finally it really dawned on him what the Lord was speaking to him was it wasn't how many people was in his church that he was looking for. It wasn't how big his ministry was he was looking for. But what he really needed in his heart was a greater manifestation of the presence of God. What he was really crying out for was a, a greater relationship with the Lord, a closer walk with God if we want to put it in those terms. And I thought, boy, that, that's, you know, very powerful way of looking at it because so often in life people are always looking for more of something. You know, they want more money. They want, you know, a better job, a, a larger ministry, whatever. They're always looking for more, 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 more. But really what their heart is craving is more of God, more of Jesus, more of a relationship with Him, more manifestation of Him in their life. And that's the key here, abiding in Him. I wanted to also read a passage to you out of a book that was written by Steve Hill. He's on with pastor with the Lord now, but he was an evangelist, a worldwide evangelist, and a key element in what we refer to as the Brownsville Revival. And he talks about a time of a dryness and a struggle in his ministry. And uh, he wrote this in his journal, and I've, I've often went back to it and read it in my own devotional time that kind of encouraged me to focus on abiding in Christ. Um, it says, only the works built from the throne room of God will last. Sometimes my energy can be my worst enemy. My eagerness to work, my fervor for lost souls, my zeal for the work of God often cloud the true purpose of life. To live as Christ, my career must be Christ. There is nothing in this world more important than drawing from the well of God's word. To lie at the feet of Jesus to be taught, instructed, guided, and directed by my Lord and Master. I long for the entity of Christ. To know him is to love him. To know him is to talk to him, to listen, to obey. What a joy it is to sit in his presence and learn of him. 
His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Might I go farther to say his plans, techniques, and methods, and so forth, are not as ours. I must continually immerse myself in the presence of God. From God and God only, I must receive my instructions for the day. I feel the problem is not the workers, it's the depth of their walk that is lacking. The Lord needs workers who are willing to take instructions from the Lord of the harvest. It's so easy with all of man's wisdom and understanding to jump into the work of God. We plow, turn, toss the seed, fertilize water, and reap without looking once to the Lord of the harvest. What is he saying? What is his timing? Where are his fields? Who is he stirring? I must know what is on the heart of Jesus. I must come daily to his table. And I've always went back to that little writing out of Steve's uh, journal because it helped me to focus so much on the absolute importance it is to come in and sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him and receive our directions, our guidance from him on everything we do, whether it be the sermons we preach, whether it be how we raise our kids, how we work on our jobs, whatever it is, it all needs to be birthed at the feet of Jesus. And I'm like Steve Hill wrote there about his, his energy is his greatest enemy. Well, sometimes that's the case case with me too. Sometimes I, I can do this and I can do that and I can do this and I can have this idea and I can have that idea and I can cook up this plan and, and all these devices rather than just simply sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. And that is the utmost importance. And we're going to see here as we examine John chapter 15 a little bit today that that is the heart and the center of John chapter 15 is that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, that word abide there so it not only applies to relationship, but duration of relationship and depth of our relationship with Christ. I've used the illustration here lately as I've taught through John chapter 15 of what I would call a childhood romance. And I don't know what it is like out there in some of the other cultures, but here in the United States when... But a lot of times when you're a young kid or a young teenager or something, you know, you go through those phases where you begin to start to want to have a girlfriend and you ask a girl to, you know, we used to ask them to go steady with us in high school. And we'd have like these little uh, initial rings and bracelets and we would give that to that girl and that would be, we were going steady and it, it was always kind of humorous looking back at it because a lot of times you'd go steady for a couple hours. You know, you'd ask the girl at the beginning of the day and she'd break up with you at the end of the day or it might go on for two or three days or a week or occasionally there was those two that they, they got together when they were young and stayed together but generally speaking they were very short relationships they were just something that you kind of did it was kind of novel and you were both kind of learning to relate in that way I guess you would say but that's not an abiding relationship that's a very temporary relationship an abiding relationship would be like a marriage covenant where a man and a woman stand before God and enter into a covenant to, to be together for a lifetime you see, to abide means to stay in a given place, state, or relationship. A state of expectancy to continue to dwell, to endure, to remain. So I want to ask you with all of that in our minds today, a simple question about abiding. Because so often people will read this verse and it talks about abide in me and I in you. And a lot of times in their minds I think they're thinking, well, that means be saved. That means be born again. If I'm a saved person, then I'm assuming then that I'm abiding in Christ. If I'm a born-again person, I'm assuming that I'm abiding in Christ, and that's what he's talking about there. But I think if we examine the scriptures a little bit closer, we'll find that there's more to it, more involved in abiding in Christ than simply being born again. And you might say, well, wait a second, preacher. Are we grafted in when we come to Jesus Christ? Does it say we're grafted in? Yes, Romans chapter 11, verse 17 says that we are a branch that is grafted in. And we're grafted in at that point in time as Gentiles who come to Christ. We are grafted in. But if you examine the scriptures, you'll find that there's a little bit more than in abiding than just simply being in Christ or being born again. Let me show you what I'm talking about. John chapter 15 verse 5 says, I am the true vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So notice something there it says. The same bringeth forth much fruit. So somebody who is abiding in Christ, one of the first things we notice there, the distinction of them, is that they bear much fruit. For example, if I had a, a, a vineyard, and I told you in that vineyard, I says, now you'll go out there, and you'll find that every branch 
that is abiding in the vine is going to show, is going to bring forth fruit. And you went around and you walked around in that vineyard and you see a lot of the branches that were abiding in the vine or a lot of the branches that were connected to the vine were bearing fruit. But you took note and you realize that, wait a second, there are some branches that are hooked onto the vine that at this point in time, for some reason, they are not bearing fruit. You see, that would tell you something because the scripture here says very plainly that if you abide in Christ, then you are bearing much fruit. So if you're abiding, you're bearing fruit. Same with the branch in the vine. If it's abiding, then it's bearing fruit. There's going to be grapes on that branch if it's abiding. The same as you and I, if we're abiding in Christ, then we're going to be a branch and it's going to show fruit. So we can understand that abiding equals fruit. Abiding equals fruit. Now, if you look at John 15, verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit. Now, then wait a second there. It's talking about branches that are in him that don't bear fruit. So apparently there can be branches in him, in, connected to the vine, that are not bearing fruit. And there are branches that are abiding, and the branches that are abiding do always bear fruit. So apparently there can be a distinction between a branch that's in Christ and a branch that's abiding in Christ. It's very plain if we look at the scriptures there. It's very obvious there. So the key then is that you can be in him and not be abiding in him. You can be, but if you're abiding in him, there is going to be fruit. And beloved, the purpose of our life is to bear fruit and glorify the Father. I uh, enjoy studying revival a lot and history of revival and and I've always enjoyed that all my Christian life, digging into revival, because there's an LMA that I believe like John, uh, 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 Charles Finney, and Charles Finney was teaching, and he always said that, you know, that a revival should be no more of a surprise to us than a harvest is to a farmer. He goes out, he plants the seeds, and he cares for that crop, and at the end of the season, he brings in a harvest. And that you and I, that we as believers, we can do the things that are necessary to bring forth revival and expect and believe for a revival harvest. We can plant the seeds of revival and expect to see the harvest of a revival come forth. And uh, so I've dug into revival, dug into revival history because I've always been fascinated by what were they doing at that time? How were they living their life? Well, how were they praying? How were they, how were they ministering? What was taking place there that we can learn from? Up, and we can learn to walk in to see greater revival in our day and in our hour. And one of the individuals that, that seen tremendous revival was a man named John Wesley. And uh, John Wesley uh, had a very powerful testimony. And uh, there was a time that he was on a ship and he was coming back actually from doing missionary work. And the ship entered into a tremendous storm and that storm began to pound upon that ship and, and became a very threatening situation. And John Wesley himself was in a tremendous panic and tremendous fear of death. Well, there were some other people there, some believers there, and they were just rejoicing and praising God and just all this joy and all this peace. And John Wesley, as he witnessed that, he said he realized they had something in their life that he didn't. And here he had been out working as a missionary. He had been out trying to do the works of God. He was coming back a discouraged man because he hadn't bore any fruit. He seen them though and he realized they had something that he didn't have. And then he went on and he, they made it back safely. He went to some of their meetings out of curiosity to find out what was going on. And John Wesley then... As he was at one of their meetings, he, he, he put his faith in Christ and him crucified as a result of the message being preached. And it was said there that he said then that his heart was strangely warmed and he had an assurance that his sins had been washed away and that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior. You see, John Wesley then went on to preach in uh, many places and he preached in fields and, and street corners and everywhere he had the opportunity to preach. But there was one key element about the message he brought forth. And that was Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And he put a great deal of emphasis on that because all, those time, all that time he had been, thought he had been serving God and working for God, but he had never had that personal witness of the Holy Spirit that, it, that told him that he was a child of God. He had been working for God, but he had not been God's child. He had never truly placed his faith in Christ and been born again. 
I remember uh, uh, quite some time ago there was an individual who, who came to River of Life, the church where this is being broadcast from. And, and this individual had grown up in church, been in church all their life. This individual had been going to church even as an adult and uh, just in church basically their entire life. And they came to a service and later on they gave the testimony that they, that day they had went home. And the Spirit of God had come upon them. And they just got on their face right there in the front room of their house and began to call out upon the Lord. And for the first time in their life, they had that witness of the Holy Spirit that they were a child of God. They shared that all of those years they had been going to church and going through the ceremonies and going through the formality, but had truly never been born again and never had that relationship began with Christ Jesus. And there may be many out there today, and you may be saying, no, okay, I, I've been live, thinking I've been living for God, but I don't know that I've had a witness of the Holy Spirit that I'm His child. Well, I encourage you right now to do like that individual did, and call upon the name of the Lord. Place your faith in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that He would wash away your sins, and make you a brand new creation, and His Spirit would come to live and dwell on the inside of you. And I'd encourage you to do that right now. Don't give the devil time to talk you out of it. Just right now in the midst of this broadcast, call upon the name of the Lord. And then I, uh, anyway, to continue on with the account of John Wesley, but one of the things that John Wesley did when he would go in and do his evangelistic work, that he would also set up groups, and they were what we would call a small group probably today. He called them societies. But the thing that he focused on so much was to teach them their daily walk with the Lord. To teach them to have that daily prayer time. To teach them to have that daily time in the Word. To teach them to have that daily time worshiping. To teach them to have that daily time out witnessing and sharing their faith. Because he understood the importance of what I'm teaching today of abiding in Christ. And what we refer to as the Wesleyan Revival. That explosion that came across the, uh, uh, England and then later on into the United States in a very powerful way. Came as a result of men and women who understood the importance of that daily walk with Jesus Christ and abiding in Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, the primary purpose of our life is to bear fruit and glorify God. And the only way to do that is through an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the very first thing that God said to mankind was it's in Genesis 1, 28, it says that God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful. So the very first mandate unto mankind was to be fruitful. And then Jesus gives us the example and the model of how to do that. A couple of verses that are very key to understanding that are John chapter 5, verse 19, where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. John chapter 5, verse 30 says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So you'll see there that Jesus does what he sees the Father do. Jesus does what he hears the Father say. Jesus does what the Father's will is. How did, he, how did he see what the Father was doing? How did he hear what the Father was doing? How did he know the will of the Father to do it? Because those times that we find in the Word where Jesus is going and praying in the mountains, Jesus is going and praying in the wilderness, Jesus is going and praying throughout the night, he's, he's abiding in a relationship with his Father, and he's hearing from his Father, and his Father is speaking to him and showing him what to do. The same way that Jesus had that abiding relationship with the Father, you and I have to have have that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to be drawing away and getting into his presence and listening to his voice and getting into his presence and, 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 and looking in the spirit to see what the Father's directions are and the guidance is. Beloved, this is of the utmost importance. You can be born again and not have that abiding relationship. You could have come to Jesus Christ and placed your faith for your salvation, but the key is that you have to have that daily walk, that daily relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to have that time where you're daily in prayer. You have to have that time when you worship Him on a daily basis and waiting upon Him and listening to Him. That time where you're meditating in the Word of God, and that's where the fruit comes forth. The Lord will begin to work in your heart and shape and mold your heart 
He'll begin to work on the inside of you and transforming you. He'll begin to lead you and guide you and direct you and show you ways to reach out to people. He'll begin to lead you and guide you and direct you and show you how to minister to other people. He will begin to empower you with his spirit and with his anointing. That all comes out of that abiding relationship. You'll find everything that God asks you to do is birth in that abiding relationship. Everything God does on this planet is some way, shape, or form going to be birthed in those abiding relationships. And even right now as this broadcast goes out, I I'm just thinking how much this planet could be impacted if everybody who's listening to this teaching would say, yes, that's what I need to do. I need to develop that abiding relationship. If all of us would begin to more and more to get on our face before God and listen to his voice and follow his guidance and his directions, we can impact this world in a mighty way. How many people would come to Jesus Christ as a result of that choice? How many people worldwide could come to Jesus Christ as a result of that decision? How much could we see the fires of revival poured out upon this planet as a result of that choice? Beloved, that is the absolute key if we just simply get before God, abide in Him on a regular basis daily basis and, and follow his instructions and his guidance we're going to see the fires of revival fall across this planet and you see when when uh, the directions were given to be fruitful immediately something happened and we understand that in Genesis chapter 3 we had the devil come in and the devil immediately began to entice Eve and began to and then we know that Eve gave in to those uh, temptations and Adam immediately did the same thing what did the devil do he had, he had got in the way of that abiding relationship between Adam and Eve and the Father. And it's the same way he operates today. We understand the need for the abiding relationship. We understand the importance of the abiding relationship. But we fight spiritual battles every moment of every day that are tried, that the enemy's putting in, our, in place to try to pull us away from that abiding relationship. And I always go back to Philippians chapter 3 and, and the Apostle Paul's passage there. And to me, that's the, one of the greatest revival passages there are. And that's the best description I know of in the Bible of a true revivalist. And that is what Paul talks about. He says when he counts all things as lost. Everything is done. Anything that would stand in the way, he counts it as lost that he might simply know Jesus Christ. And we need to be in the place where we say, you know what? I count everything as lost. I count everything as done. It doesn't matter what it is. If it hinders me from my abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, then I'm going to put it by the side. I'm not going to have any thing to do with it because the most important thing to a revivalist is that relationship. A true person revivalist is not going to allow anything to hinder their abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. No matter what I have to do, I'm going to put it to the wayside so I can be with Jesus. He is, that is the number one priority in our life, that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. And praise God, I encourage you right now today, as we wind this teaching down, to just stop where you're at and don't let anything get in your way. Don't let anything hinder you. But just spend some time with Jesus today. Just get before God right now. Get some time in prayer. Worship Him. We're going to close with a little bit of worship music here. Just jump right in there and worship the Lord. And just spend some time to say, Lord, here I am. Here I am, Lord, show me your ways. Here I am, Lord, speak to me. Here I am, Lord, lead me, guide me, instruct me. Here I am, Lord, do what needs to be done in my heart. Do what needs to be changed in my heart, Lord. Revive me today, Lord. Revive me today, Lord. Let me come into your presence. I read a thing the other day, and it was it was an interesting quote. It said, it, it, the man said, I believe it was Leonard Raymond Hill was talking about, and he said that we used to go to church to, to encounter the presence of God. Now we go to church to listen to a man tell us about God. You see, beloved, you need the presence of God. You need to abide in the presence of God. You need right now to abide in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible tells us in Luke 6, 38, Give it, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again. One of the great financial blessings of the Lord is we learn that as we give, we receive. As we give liberally, then we receive liberally. Bring in the harvest liberally. So we want to give you the opportunity to give into this ministry, to partner with us, to proclaim the whole counsel of God in the full power of 
the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to send in an offering, please send that to River of Life Church, 246 Derby Street, Pekin, Illinois, 61554, United States of America. Let me repeat that address. River of Life Church, 246 Derby, Pekin, Illinois, 61554, the United States of America. God bless you. Yeah.